Um, okay, so while we're waiting the last minute for our final on-site speaker, um, just to let everyone know, we'll be going one round for each of our speakers where they'll have a chance to introduce their work and themselves. And then we'll move on to the second round with an open roundtable discussion. And please feel free to drop questions in the chat box. Our online moderator, Bea, will be collecting these and we will address the, the questions uh, in a question and answer session at the end. All right, I see it's 8.50. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who's joined. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Stella and I'm currently with NetMission.Asia, Malaysia Youth IGF, ISOC Malaysia and, Studi and Kyushu University. So I'll be moderating today's session and it's great to see everyone. So first off, I'd like to give the opportunity to welcome our first speaker for the session. On my right, that would be Luke Thieu. Uh, please take it away. Thank you, sir. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so the topic of today's workshop would mainly be online linguistic gender stereotypes. And you may be wondering what does that mean? So basically, linguistic gender stereotypes are generalizations or assumptions that people make based on someone's gender that are reflected in language. And these stereotypes include beliefs about the roles, behaviors, characteristics, and also abilities of individuals based on their gender. Now, these linguistic gender stereotypes can be reflected in different aspects of language, such as gendered pronouns, job titles, descriptive language, and also their conversational roles. And to just narrow down the scope and relate it towards the internet and my work currently, uh, which is focusing on the adjectives, uh, one part of language. So adjectives are one aspect of linguistic gender stereotypes. And according to Castillo, Mayen, and Montes Burgess, uh, certain adjectives are commonly associated with women. As for example, emotional, understanding, sweet, and submissive. So as you may uh, assume or you may understand, these adjectives reinforce the stereotype that women are more emotional. On the other hand, adjectives like strong, brave, competent, or bold uh, can also or are often associated with men. And this reinforces the stereotype of men being more dominant or logical. Now, these adjectives create gender-based expectations and limitations. And these influence how individuals are perceived and treated both in the online and in the offline world. Such language, as you may assume or may understand, has the potential to shape societal attitudes and contributes to gender inequalities by reinforcing traditional gender roles and norms. Now you may be wondering, so where is the online or internet part of this workshop? Well, we're getting to there. So linguistic gender stereotypes can also be observed in online advertisements. Um, this, is, this idea actually came from myself uh, studying my undergraduate degree at University of Science Malaysia. And I think on the panel today, we also have Dr. Manjit, who was my supervisor for that course, and really guided me to make this research possible so in the early 2000s, with the rise of data-driven advertising and targeting capabilities, online advertisements became increasingly personalized and tailored to specific audiences, including gender-based targeting. Despite increasing emphasis on gender equality in the social development goals of developed nations and its recognition as a fundamental human right by the United Nations, studies revealed that gender stereotyping in advertising continues to endure. And according to Boyd 2021, linguistic gender stereotypes in advertising are used in targeted marketing and pr product positioning. As a result, to focus on specific group of buyers, the producers persuade buyers by using the right choice of words regarding the product. So moving to my research, uh, which was conducted with a small respondent group of 43, uh, they were all aged between 21 to 20, 22, so it can be considered as Gen Z youth. And a total of 183 Instagram captions were selected from 
companies that I won't name. And from those captions, 151 adjectives were shortlisted. And these are some of the adjectives that we asked the respondents their views on and which uh, gender or which genders do they feel that these adjectives describe the best. So what do the results show? Well, the results show that the majority of respondents have similar gender connotations for all of the 15 adjectives. And most of the adjectives have at least 50% of respondents each answering the same gender association. So there's a brief picture or overview of the results that we were able to get. And the participants of the questionnaire hold slightly more gender biases towards these adjectives compared to the qualitative study on previous literature that my team and I read through. However, there are instances where the respondents were very transparent about their gender biases, like for the adjectives sparkling and floral, in which almost all the respondents think those adjectives conclusively represent only women. So they thought that uh, by using the adjective sparkling or for all, you can sell them or you don't even uh, use it to describe men. However, there are also situations where the participants have ambiguous gender associations with the adjectives, like for the adjectives sophisticated and romantic, in which the respondents' gender biases are about evenly split between men, women, and both genders. So what about the way forward? There are similarly mixed gender adjectives on both Instagram pages, which might be because those brands are slowly attuning to a more careful approach to gender characterizations and right now opening up to the spectrum and uh, different sorts of how people would like to identify as. And as for the perceptions of gender stereotypical adjectives you utilize in Instagram captions, the respondents conform to the gender stereotypes. And they also seem conflicted in opinion for others and have repulsed the gender stereotypes associated with the adjectives for the rest. So seeing how language and culture are inextricably intertwined, it would be great prominence to include the role of language in bridging the gender digital divide. I'd just like to end with a quote, the tie of language is perhaps the strongest and most durable that can unite us. And I think I've taken up my time for now. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Luke, for your uh, brief overview on your research. I think it's very interesting to see how we can, you know, uh, relate to you know our own experiences. I think most of us would have seen perhaps different kind of advertisements that you might get from your different gendered uh, friends. And so that was perspective from our Asia Pacific youth. Now let's move on to our next on-site speaker. We have with us Arnaldo de Santana. Sorry if my, the name is incorrect, but yes, please, your seven minutes starts now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm Arnaldo. I'm from Brazil, uh, representing the youth of La um, Latin American Caribbean. Now I'm researching, but I'm also a lawyer and an internationalist, and I am researching about uh, LGBTQI community and some stereotypes that we face daily. Uh, at first, uh, I came here to talk about some of the issues that we face there that mostly are linked to the specificities that market pl puts on us. So, uh, gender can be read as a um, type of module that gives power to some groups and put on others in a position to be, I don't know, exploited. Also, uh, as we are talking about the stereotypes, I'd like to bring here the meaning of the scripts of gender that we face daily on our society. So if you are a girl or assign as assign it as a girl when you're like born, you have to do and fulfill some of the development that society made to you. And if you go all the way into another perspective, you are not um, great to this society. The same, the same way goes to uh, the meaning when you are not, uh, when you are assigned as boy. So, um, a linguistic stereotype 
is a way that people react to speech varieties associated with lower prestige groups and attributing negative, to, uh, negative characteristics to the speakers. And it all goes through a gender structure uh, perspective. So who holds the power and who can put this power to impose something in society? Uh, as minorities, we face some problems daily and especially nowadays that we face some of the retrocess on society, it's really important to talk about this. I am here not <laughs> opposing any slides because I feel like it's more great to bring the possibility to all of us to talk about the development of uh, internet that does not bring some uh, stereotypes to our days and to try to make a more participative way of building what we do. Also, I'm trying, I will reference some of my friends that are developing some um, researches about the gender stereotypes, linguistic stereotypes, and how does it impact the twins? There are um, people aged between 8 and 16 years, there are children and teens, and how does the market influence their perspectives online? Um, so, we have some norms that are developed by society, Internet, it is reproduced. So, if uh, I am a girl on the internet, I have to develop my way to, to catch attention, especially if I am trying to get on the market to uh, influence. And this makes, um, I feel that it talks a little bit about what we have today with the development of some um, industries of um, media that brings children to work as uh, performers. And um, we face it daily. Nowadays in Brazil, we have some discussion about how can children that works since um, really um, early ages handle the, the way of having so much money. And I feel that I'm going a little bit out of the, the topic, but uh, talking about this, we can face uh, some ways that our structure and our society, and also the reflection of society on the internet, because um, Talking about the internet, we talk about also power and the face of violence, but um, about um, the patterns, the standards. And when you have low uh, ways of speaking and when you put yourself on a way that you break these rules that are encrypted, you go through a way of trying to to so to go beyond the the these stereotypes um i feel like this would be the first statement thank you everybody and thank you so much ronaldo right right on time. So thank you very much for the uh, perspective coming from a different, completely different region. So now we'll be going on to the my other end where we have another on-site speaker. So we'll like to hear next from Julia Teresa Rodriguez Cool. So yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Stella, for giving me this opportunity to speak here at the IGF. Uh, my perspective and my uh, narrative will be different. I will change the scope from uh, male to the female uh, and think about the gender stereotypes that are 
used beyond simple prejudice. They are weaponized to mobilize pre mostly uh, specific demogra demographic in uh, the Americas and especially Brazil, the white male demographic who is from 14 to 20, 35 years old, they are mobilized by the usage of linguistic gender stereotypes uh, in, a, in an attempt to recruit them to radical and terrorist groups. These uh, memes and jokes and, other, and many types of content are used as a way to gamify, gamify hate. You first propose a game, a simply a joke. You, uh, the perpetrator, not you, <laughs> the perpetrator, submit that joke in a public uh, venue on the internet. Uh, we have seen a lot of activity on younger, uh, on younger platforms and also more related to g the gaming community using those jokes to first spot someone who is prone to prejudice or prone to violence with that prejudice because we all might face and uh, deliver our uh, deliver actions based on prejudice, but using that to harm others is another step. And it's another step based on many researchers. Uh, Rakesh, a cyber psychologist from India of the Rastriya Raksha University. Uh, he is specializing in study cyber terrorism through psychology and showing that uh, ensuing on participating on these activities bring uh, a, a reward, a psychological and chemical reward on, on the male audience who's trying to uh, diminish, uh, demobilize, and attack uh, the female youth, mostly. And uh, also, uh, there's a study in Germany, an university that fails, I fail to recall the name right now, that when trying to uh, uh, made in-service teachers aware in the, in the, in the, in the German universities, there's a great, there's a, the majority of the audience is touched by the dynamics and the educational programs that existed, uh, that exist on the subjects that are trying to convey an, an ethic, uh, pro, an ethic program, an ethic guideline to the teachers, but there's a minority where the activities have no effect. They don't even get it that it is an activity to, uh, bring awareness to female and uh, to female questions, female problems, and also uh, uh, an attempt to stop uh, misogynistic and misogynistic behavior and attempts of diminishing uh, the power of women. And then it, my research studies a task a task group in the Brazil Human Rights Ministry that tries to typify what is hate speech. And, and it's a really important movement, it's a really important action taken by a government to, to, to try to categorize what is uh, hate speech. And they they, we were trying to see if the, the, this test group was seeing this uh, gamification behavior in the youth and it's trying to and recognizes that mo that movement, that t trend, it is happening uh, amidst our, our youth, our male youth. And we found that although it didn't specifically targeted uh, terrorist groups who are sought to radicalize the youth with the internet, linguistic stereotypes, they can recognize that linguistic stereotypes and the internet can make uh, can can both participate in an infrastructure and a design and uh, of 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 a platform that facilitates hate. And so we have uh, a demographic that enjoys what they're doing. 
that they are uh, apath apathic to the to to awareness on awareness discourses, and that they are being co-opted to uh, organized groups and to 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 try and pass uh, demobilized protests, uh, attack specific individuals, people that stand out, uh, young youth leaders, young female youth leaders, and this is all connected, leading to a point of uh, rising uh, reactionary, uh, rising reactionary demographic in my country, uh, giving us a difficult and violent and sad environment. And uh, we, I would like to encourage everyone or in anyone who, to, who wish to know better or is dealing that, with that situation in their country to reach out to me and many others who are trying to uh, strengthen human rights in the world. Thank you so much, Julia, for your sharing. It's very interesting to see how we progress from perhaps like a more um, neutral, not, not neutral, but like a more introductory stance into how linguistic gender stereotypes can be in your life to perhaps more extreme cases. And so I'd like to open the, just for briefly, for a short one question. If anyone has a question from our online participants who've been with us, or from on-site, just a quick question that you may have for our youth researchers for um, their, their, what they've presented so far about their, um, their efforts in researching online linguistic gender stereotypes, or if you have any general question that you'd like to see that brought up in the round table um, immediately after our next few uh, speakers. So yeah, a quick check around the room. Ah, uh, yes, please go ahead, the mic would be. Good morning, I am Wilson Guilherme. Uh, I am a non-binary uh, person from Brazil and uh, I am part of the part of the Youth Brazil delegation. I think uh, I have a comment and a question. First, the comment to which is how important it is uh, it's to encourage debates about language diversity in digital media and how much this especially affects LGBT queer uh, A uh, plus people. An important point about language is to think about the moderation of digital content, uh, which above all needs to be done based on realizations of discourse. In Brazil, for example, we have the word bicha, which is which can be used in negative contexts, but it can also be used in context to promotion identity uh, and affirmation. Does language when correlated with moderation can mitigate violence? But to the same extent I can reinforce violence when it is related to the reframing of concepts. My question then for the panel is how con reconcile contact moderation agendas with spaces and narratives from vulnerability communities such as LGBTQ plus people and black people. For example, the language of Brazil, Pajubá. Obrigado. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think very interesting discussion and thanks to the panel for, you know, initiating this kind of very streamed uh, kind of discussion. My, my point of view is this is very true that, you know, social media is very much um, kind of mirror of our regular socialization life, or social life, or what we are thinking, but it's probably it is, um, even more, you know, reflective in on social media rather than the mirror. So uh, the, the, my, uh, let me share the uh, fear. The fear is the, you know, sometimes we see how social media is being cultivated by anti, you know, uh, kind of various stereotype thinkings, um, or how they you know, propagate the violence against the various gender uh, minority groups. Um, or, and I don't know, do you have any information or if you can shed some light afterwards about 
how the um, artificial intelligence also propagating this kind of uh, you know stereotype behavior and kind of um, and then the violence against the other sexual minority groups. This is the one second thing is the do you see any um, possibilities creating narratives um, in terms of this kind of uh, hate speech or you know this violence that actually can be codified um, and you know I don't know so you know making some kind of positive narratives or narrative against this kind of uh, violences or narrative against this kind of uh, gender stereotypes. So whether it is possible through um, artificial intelligence again. Uh, thank you very much. Right. Thank you for our comments and questions from the from the floor. So I, I'll let Julia go ahead. I would like to address uh, Wilson's question and uh, the same report, which would uh, be in English, uh, Report of recommendations to the to tackling hate speech and extremism in Brazil uh, has a section about hate speech grammatic. And in Brazil, for context, we have uh, many grammatics. We have the formal grammatic. We have a popular grammatic and we can out, we do have also a queer grammatic and there is a targeting of those extremist groups to mimic and ridiculize ridicularize this grammatic which is highly based on the african influence of the west uh, west african influence of the people who were kidnapped to brazil in our colonial past but uh, their uh, heritage lived on on our grammatic and our form of speech. And this is being targeted as also a, a, a mean, a, a project to mobilize the youth saying, having, make, having jokes and also uh, protest against uh, the approach or any uh, Recognizes that this grammatic might have in any public venue, maybe the uh, uh, a social media, maybe a television media, maybe a radio uh, program, that which they deny uh, the the validity of this of this way of speech, we, because it's true, it's sincere. And it's the way that we found out to identify each other and to uh, reorganize ourselves as a community. And this is being also targeted and weaponized, saying uh, roughly as the gay way of saying things, <laughs> but or the gay gay speech. But it's much more than that, and it's much more complex because it 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 is not only us that use. That kind of speech is just uh, don't, don't, the thing is that doesn't it doesn't matter uh, what it is. There is a, a drain of what the content is. They don't care about the content. They care about the co the, the group that uses such content, and they will sub, uh, they will, will ridicularize. They will satirize that to spot people and spot people who are who might have a, a sensitivity to hate speech and also be more uh, gullible to think that they are changing society for the better by persecuting a group because of the way they speak so yes uh, this report also recognizes this type of this uh, strategy this st strategy the strategy to of uh, illegal groups to to act and enact their wills and projects for the Brazilian community, but we are not restricted here to my country. This is a specific um, example to enlighten the audience about uh, the many aspects of online linguistic gender stereotypes. Thank you so much, Julia, for your answer. So just for the second question, um, it will be addressed by our later speaker. But first, we'll move on to our next speaker we have with us. So we have with us, uh, joining us from online from Malaysia, we have with us um, Dr. Manjit Kaur. Uh, please, if we could have the online speakers on the screen. And yes, your seven minutes starts now.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, am I loud and clear? Yep. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity here yeah, to uh, share some views here. Okay, uh, regarding uh, the theme of today's uh, talk, the online linguistic gender stereotypes, uh, what I would like to focus on is uh, we cannot deny that uh, these uh, discrimination issues exist online. Okay, but uh, what we need to look into here is maybe uh, what is the way forward? How can we address these problems? How can we improve the situation? Okay, so therefore we need to focus, for example, on uh, inclusive language. Okay, inclusive language. So inclusive language have to, uh, how do I say, acknowledge? Okay, the diversity that the genders present, okay? So uh, like in Asian context, for example, in Malaysia, uh, we talk about male and female, and uh, when you talk about the uh, LGBTQ uh, group, there are also some issues here, sensitive issues, because uh, due to the, uh, how do I say, yeah, the racial composition of the country, uh, Malaysia being a Muslim country, okay? So when it comes to LGBTQ uh, rights, uh, so in terms of how they are represented uh, in advertisements, for example, online, there are sensitive issue and also uh, some kind of discrimination that exists, okay? So what is need needed is actually inclusive language, okay? That is actually uh, sensitive to all the groups of people, no matter uh, which gender category are you in, okay? And also promotes actual, uh, how do I say, equal opportunity for all of them, okay? That's basically very, very important, okay? So basically, uh, how, how, how can, can we ensure that this can uh, be, uh, how do I say, imposed or implemented in the online setting, okay? Firstly, is to choose uh, gender neutral terms. It is sometimes very, very difficult for us. Like, for example, a presentation done by uh, Mr. Luke just now. Uh, when you're promoting uh, products, uh, doing advertisements for perfumes. Okay, if you do a, a, a survey, uh, you will notice the kind of adjectives that are used. Okay, are they more inclined uh, uh, to feminism? Or do they, uh, how do I say, uh, promote uh, masculinity? Okay, that is also based again on uh, who is the product targeted for. Okay, however, how can we uh, come up with a situation, a kind of a framework that addresses okay, gender, uh, gender neutrality, even when you're promoting a female-based product or a male-based product. So these are the issues that needs to be uh, considered. Okay, these are very, very important issues. Okay, next, uh, what I would like to say, uh, especially also uh, in the context, uh, let's say, a uh, workplace context. Okay, workplace context uh, in terms of uh, when you talk about uh, sensitive language, differences between male and female. Okay, how, how can you uh, reinforce uh, the diversity? Okay, earlier I mentioned about gender equality, but... Uh, to have this uh, phenomenon, gender equality, uh, to be uh, impo uh, I mean, uh, implemented 100% at the workplace or to have a situation whereby uh, this gender e equality, it's totally impossible, okay? It's totally impossible. So we need to work to the best. So what 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 is the best in terms of... Uh, promoting or enforcing, uh, introducing and enforcing uh, diversity. Okay, diversity. So if you say, uh, if you look at uh, the whole picture of online linguistic stereotypes, uh, what if we can, uh, what if we uh, define that or cluster that as promoting diversity? Okay, that's also uh, one part of the coin. Okay, one, we say it's actually, uh, how do I say, it's not fair to a particular group, okay? So linguistic, uh, what uh, online linguistic uh, stereotypes in terms of classification of gender 
can also be considered as something uh, that can be a kind of like harassment. But at the same time, you can also look at it uh, as promoting diversity, diversity through language, you know, uh, the use of adjectives, you know, to uh, describe feminism, okay, to describe women, to describe male, to describe the third group or the fourth group, okay? So at, at times we cannot say that uh, it's being stereotypical. It's also promoting diversity. You need the existence of it, but how it is used, how it is addressed, that's very, very important, okay? to start with education, to create the awareness among the youngsters, okay? Not to misjudge it, okay? But to respect the diversity that is presented through the language to uh, explain or to label someone, okay? As what he or she is, okay? So that's, that's very, very important, okay? So this will actually, uh, I mean, kind of like contribute to a sense of belonging for all the groups of people, okay, in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, I see a product uh, which is uh, being sold and, uh, sorry, which is being advertised and uh, it, uh, it is described with uh, usage of certain words that uh, I'm unhappy about, okay, and you have another person also looking at the same product from a different perspective, okay? In terms of how the product is described, okay? So how, how, how do you create here a sense of belonging for both parties, you know, in terms of, uh, I'm gonna use the product, but I'm not happy with how it's described. Okay, another person is happy with how it's described. How, how do we uh, create a sense of belonging for both parties here? Okay, so it, it, it boils down back again uh, to early age education in educating people, okay, uh, the youngsters, okay, to how to be more sensitive, okay, towards how you want to represent the product, to how you want to teach the youngsters, okay, that uh, to use words uh, more responsibly, but at the same time to also uh, respect the diversity that comes with each gender, how each gender is labeled, how each gender is, uh, how do I say, described and so on, okay? Uh, but at the same time, we can make it more, uh, how do I say, uh, unbiased towards uh, one gender, okay? Unbiased towards one gender. That is very, very important, okay? To avoid the gendered assumptions. We also have, we will always have these gendered assumptions that when you want to sell a women-based product and male-based product, okay, you have to use certain words to describe that particular group, okay? But I mean, like uh, diversity can be there, but at the same time, you need to ensure there is no biasness, okay? That's very, very important, okay? So uh, what I would like to also focus on here is usage of, uh, I mean, coming up with a guideline, a general language guideline, okay? A general language guideline on how you can ensure that uh, when you have the diversity in terms of the uh, linguistic aspects used online, you are able to ensure uh, there is no uh, discrimination, okay, biasness, okay? And at the same time, you also promote the diversity of using a very diverse linguistic elements. Right. Okay. Oh, so sorry yes. to cut you here, Dr. Manjit, but thank you very much for, um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next speaker before we'll come back to your points on, um, I think, the general guideline, the linguistic guideline, which I think is very interesting. But um, we'd like to move on, perhaps cross-region, to our next online speaker, um, if you, yes, would please go ahead. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thanks for the invitation to this panel. Uh, well, uh, my focus uh, during this conversation is going to be more related to the user experience or gender-based people in social media. 
uh, and how gender stereotypes actually affect uh, the way the the way the content and displays in social media. Especially, I focus myself my my research in TikTok because I like the because I like to I wanted to understand uh, the intersection of being youth. Uh, on social media, when you are uh, also gender, uh, a person that identifies as a gender diverse, for example, non binary, queer, or another identities outside the binary, outside the binary male and female. Uh, one of the things uh, that I realized making this, um, this research is that most of the platforms that are using more content moderation uh, uh, actually weaponize uh, the content of people that identify as gender drivers in a way that the uh, the shadow binding or blood that content more than often that they are that they actually uh, people that I that identify uh, as another gender uh, as another gender uh, does uh, so I try to comp I try to like uh, ask to the people exactly. Uh, I came up with fifty three interviews from different people from Latin America that were then telling me their experience using the platform and what they had to do to uh, to like align their identities to TikTok in a way that they actually can spread themselves in a, a pretty much in a normative way to follow the, uh, the expectation of the platform, the expectation of an algorithm in order to still be present in the platform without any problem and without being, without being targeted by the channel banning or by censoring the content or something like that. Most of the censor of the content came from the use or, or a specific hashtag related to the language that we use as a LGBTQI community or as a gender diverse people online. Uh, most of the cases that I came to study uh, says exactly that the, when they use some specific question, uh, so a specific words they were their content were no sometimes less visualized or just uh, take down on the platform without any reason and when they asked why the the content was taken down on the on the platform there wasn't an explanation of why exactly uh, exactly they do that they should only say it was again the code conduct of the platform so uh, so that is when I came up with the question of how exactly we can do a plat a plat how we can how we can actually own a platform or for an identity in algorithmic system that actually is not promoting or identities on site or on site of it. Yeah. And it's a hard one to answer, I had to say that. But most of the people say that actually inside of that, they, they never fully align their identities and never fully, uh, uh, they never fully feel accepted inside of the platform because of the restriction or the self censor that they had to do be like uh, used in their everyday life. So probably most of the content that you see about LGBTQI people inside of the, all this platform are actually uh, more related to a trend that it was imposed by someone that is already less relevant in the platform because when someone is already relevant into the platform and actually create content related to LGBTQI people or gender diversity, uh, that's when the content became somehow uh, acceptable inside of the platform. When you try to propose another things that they don't consider 
it could be like a it could be part of a train or something like that that content is it doesn't show as much as the at the other and the content actually get, became a way to restrict the the way they present themselves in online this came up with um one of the many things that they say they actually this platform needs to improve and be more clear about how they how what are the community standards in terms of not only languages but also the content that they allow there because sometimes the content they actually portray in the profiles is so similar to the gender binary but somehow that content uh, that content is not showing or not show not, not showing in the same way or it just stay down on the platform without any reason so one, that was one of the many things that they, they say also another also another thing that a lot of that a lot of people then I try to like convey like a general recommendation in, in after the many the many talks that I have with them is that we need to find as a community a way to shift this this system toward a space or in which identification on part of these historical marginalized communities and underrepresented communities in a way that is uh, actually made more sense that the, med that the mediation made by the different algorithm algorithms ensure the digital rights of or the, or the digital rights are, the, are free of expression or the or the being without censorship or free of constant like cleaning their spaces or healing the spaces or construction of the identities in the sense of what is expressed as normal. Uh, right. One way to so sorry to cut you yeah. in here, but so we're just yeah, for perfect. interest of time, I'm... right? Thank you so much. It's right on time for seven minutes. So we'd like to move on to our next speaker for their next seven minutes. We have with, uh, again joining us from online, uh, Donna Raj. So yes, please go ahead as well as with your um, presentation. Okay, hello everyone. Can you see and hear me okay? Yep, all okay. Yes, great, good. Thank you so much. Thank you um, <clears throat> to the organizers for this session. And hello everyone. My name is Dhanaraj Thakur. I am uh, the research director at the Center for Democracy and Technology. I'm from Jamaica in the Caribbean, but I'm based in the United States. Uh, CDT is a, a tech policy organization based also in the United States. And, that focuses on human rights and digital spaces. So there are two main points I wanna make with regard to the overall theme of this um, uh, session. First, with regard to the issues around how language can be used for hate and to promote violence, which a previous speaker already alluded to, and how gender stereotypes can be uh, also leveraged and used in language to promote false and, and mis- and disinformation um, are key aspects of online in, the online information environment and contribute to the gender digital divide. The second point I want to make is that we often think of artificial intelligence tools like natural language processing tools and uh, large language models in the ways that they can be used to address these problems, for example, to clean up the kind of hate speech and violence and uh, misinformation that's targeted at, 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 at women and other gender identities. And I argue that this actually makes the problem worse. So to talk a bit more about language on, of hate and misinformation, mis and disinformation, um, this kinds of violence, rhetoric, violent language, as well as mis and disinformation, as I mentioned, is predicated on gender stereotypes, which we heard previous speakers describe in better detail uh, earlier. But all of those often have the disproportionate impacts on women. And we, there is research around the world, many different countries to show this to be the case. There is less research that focuses on non-binary and trans people. But, I, but the, the research that does exist actually shows that the problem could be even worse for those groups of people. One important aspect of this is to take the, an intersectional approach and not just look at gender, but other 
dimensions of identity. And when we do that, we find that there are subgroups that actually are more targeted with this kind of violent speech and more targeted with this kind of this and this information. And this leads to several different kinds of impacts, one of which is had a negative impact on the gender digital divide. It actually makes it worse. And there, again, there's research in different, in particular in Global South that shows this. It undermines the political participation of women and other gender identities. Um, it has serious economic health impacts, mental health impacts, and it has significant impacts on freedom and expression and chilling effects. In other words, it suppresses the speech of the people that are targeted, um, of more, uh, very often women in public life. One um, example I wanna use is some research that we did to help illustrate this. This was focused on women of color political candidates in the 2020 US election. Women of color is a term used in the US to describe women of non-European descent. So Asian American women, Latina women, African American women and others. Um, we looked at data from Twitter during the 2020 elections. And we looked at a representative sample of all the candidates that ran at the federal level, at the national level in that election. And we found a couple of things with regard to women of color candidates. So here I wanna emphasize this intersectional approach to how to illustrate how these kinds of hate speech and mis- and disinformation are targeted at particular groups of women. So not women in general. What we found was that women of color political candidates were twice as likely as other candidates to be targeted with mis- and, disinformation, mis and disinformation, twice as likely as other candidates, including white women and white men and so on. There are four times as likely as white candidates to be subject to violent abuse online, violent speech online. And they are more likely than others to be targeted with a combination of false information and online abuse. Um, I, I raise this example to illustrate this problem of the severe kinds of impacts that particular women face online because of this kind of uh, that the way language is used in this kind of hateful and violent way, as well as to propagate gender stereotypes to promote false information about, about women. So the other issue I wanted to talk about was the use of AI, which uh, someone in the audience asked about. Um, and I'll focus on large language models. Large language models, think chat GPT, are, are essentially, uh, uh, machine, a machine learning technique to look at large amounts of data, in this case text, and make predictions about what kinds of text the user wants to see. So you are, if you think of ChatGPT, you might put in a prompt, what day is it today? And based on all the training data it has available, it can make a guess. And to be clear, that's all large language models do. They make guesses, very good guesses, but it's all, all they're doing is making guesses uh, or, or predictions. They are not thinking, they're not human, they're just making guesses. The challenge for us is when large language models are applied to non-English languages. Most models um, like ChatGPT and many other models are based on what on data that's available online. So they look at the entire internet and the web and draw data from that. As we know, the majority of the web is in English, even though uh, the vast majority of the world does not speak English. So this is this kind of um, paradox and problem. So what does that, what that means is that there are many languages in the world which are referred to as low resource languages. And I use a quote because I'm not sure that's a, the correct, uh, the appropriate term to use, but among computer scientists, they refer to them as low resource languages. In other words, there's not enough data available for those languages that can support um, the use, the training of these large language models. Examples include Hindi, which is a very big language, Amharic, Telugu, Zulu, and so on and so on. These are not small languages in terms of population size, but they don't have that much data available online. So because these languages are low resource, the use of large language models in those cases won't be as effective. And this is, this is critical because it has implications for um, the use of these models to address some of the problems I mentioned earlier, the, the, the violent speech targets at women and non-binary and trans people, and the mis- and disinformation targets at women, particularly those in public life. What happens when we're using non-English languages? These models as a tool to solve the problem 
will fall short. And here is the final point I want to end with, that in many of the countries where we talk about low resource languages, many of the countries written in the global south, which have, where the digital divide exists, that is fewer people are, uh, fewer, fewer people are online, there is a significant gender digital divide, which means that men are more likely to be online. Men are more likely to be online, they are producing more content online, which is the content that large language models use. So we have a vicious cycle that's happening. The models are using content in these non-language contexts that are produced by men to propagate uh, further stereotypes that uh, can undermine and, and create further problems for the addressing problems like violence, speech and gender, mis and disinformation. So I will stop here for now, and then we can talk further in the subsequent discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Jana Raj, for your uh, sharing. It's really interesting to see, we addressed the question earlier brought up by the floor on how, what it looks like now about using AI to address this issue. And I really like that you mentioned how the gender lingu linguistic stereotypes essentially is a vicious cycle in which the issue about the majority of content being English would also relate to the global south, global north divide. And that also ends up, you know, repropagating, reproducing that female and male uh, traditional gender stereotype of which would be more likely to be online. And so we have um, time for our final speaker, um, just for the first round, seven minutes, uh, also joining us from online, uh, Julianne. Hello. Uh, thank you, Stella, Luke, and NetMission to inviting me to this interesting conversation. My name is Juliana, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I'm actually I was label myself as, as independent researcher, but this time I will use my head as the translator for the Global Voice. Global Voice is citizen journalism platform, but also working on the multi multilingual internet. Okay, uh, I will start with the fact that language has a such important role to build the perception and image. Why? Um, because language can be seen as a form of magic that impacts the world. What we say and how we use language affects, affects to our thinking, imagination, and, and our reality. And uh, my language, Indonesia, doesn't have a gender like Spanish or French. So I grew up without knowledge about the, how the gender language has the impact to build the perception. But where well, it changed when I started to learn in French and then Spanish. At the time, I realized that, that the gender has the, some crucial impact on how the people who use the language has a per perception on themselves. Uh, in those both languages, the gender are autom automatically changed into masculine when the plural subject has the mixed gender. When I talk to friends who speak those two languages, they said it made it made it make them to think that masculine or man is has a better position in community or more superior than than feminine or feminine or women. Besides from the gender, language has also has a nuance. I will take the example in English. There is some words which has a negative connotation and apply it only to women, women, and girls. Bossy, for example, has a pejorative meaning and is targeted to women on girls who want to who want try to lead or lead the, uh, the community or the group. Uh, and that that's make, make people think they, the women and the girls act like boss. It's, uh, it never happened in the men who want to try to lead in the community or the group. Uh, the pejorative, pejorative meaning is also happen in other languages who doesn't have a gender grammar. In Indonesia, for example, uh, the earth and the sadly, the, the, this, this pejorative language and the slur uh, words has quite Use uh, in quite a on online bullying when targeted women, girl, and LGBT group, and is using this kind of certain stereotype. And what the meaning in digital words 
as I mentioned before, the pejorative and the slur language has been used to attack women, girls, girls and LGBT people when they are active in the in, in internet. Several studies and it has been taken that online bullying will make they less active in the internet. Then it is, this mean a, a negative move when it comes to minimize gender digital divide. So it's women, girls, and LGBT uh, uh, people will be less active and afraid to speak uh, spoof up in a digital world. Another case is about the function of in the internet, especially in the translation machine. There is some words when in when it translates from other language to English, is automatically automatically translate with the masculine subjects. For example, if I want to translate subject is a doctor, and then the result in is English is he is a doctor. But when it comes to nurse or a secretary, the subject is a feminine or a woman. Uh, later today, we have we now have the chat GBT has that, that has been mentioned with uh, Dana's presentation and other lang large language model with use AI to scrap and train the source from the internet. Why it's become the problem? Because uh, I will write in the future, it will be it will be decriminalized certain race, gender, and language if we couldn't start to promote more gender neutral and inclusive language. And what we could do as the community, we can provide a constant input, discussion, and reflection that could make the language more inclusive and gender neutral in digital and real life. I appreciate the translation machine. Machine now is more gender neutral and not associate some words, some words or working or job occupation with certain gender. And those as a result from the community input who's constant, constantly give the feedback into the in, into the uh, translation machine com company. As the closing, I believe the language is a denied denied dynamic and I believe it still grow during the time in real and digital world. It needs it needs constant work from the communities and who also give input input about make the language more gender neutral, more inclusive, as it could more fair for everybody. Thank you and waiting for the discussion. Thank you so much, Juliana. Very interesting to hear from your perspective um, in the industry of translation. So we've heard from all our speakers for, for the first round. And I think I'd like to go to perhaps um, our second round, begin our second round of roundtable discussion. So looking at, um, perhaps I could start off with Anaraj uh, for a question for you um, regarding what you feel on what measures can be taken to improve or any questions that you feel that um, coming from your perspective, having researched, you know, the impact or the potential, well, in your case, that your case is against the potential of using AI, um, what do you think it needs to be discussed more particularly? Yes, thank you for the question. I think this topic is precisely what needs to be discussed more, particularly within the industry around the, what I'd call the gender gap in training data. I mentioned the problem uh, in the global south of the gender digital divide. There was a recent study uh, from the University of Pittsburgh that looked at the training data that's used for chat GPT. Let's take that as an example. The training data that's used for chat GTP, GPT generally and found that only 26.5% of that training data contained data that was authored by women. So the vast majority, almost three quarters of data was authored by men. So I often think then about the implications of this. If we think about how chat GPT is being considered now and incorporated, for example, in schools and in the education system or models like chat GPT and the kind of gender gap in the training that exists and what implications that I will have for youth going forward. I think many of the other speakers have already pointed to some of these kinds of problems. I think, therefore, it is the questions, particularly at a policy level, in the education system, in industry, about these gender gap, the gender gap in, in training data. 
Right. Thank you so much, Dana Raj. So, um, since you mentioned schools, so we have an educator with us on our panel. I thought I'd like to hop over to Dr. Manjit for your thoughts on, well, you mentioned earlier that you, you were looking for perhaps a suggestion about a general language or a linguistic guideline. How do you foresee this can be related to what Dana Raj mentioned about uh, the, you know, the, da the data that's being used to train these L large language models? Okay, hi there again. Okay, just now uh, what I mentioned was on the learning guidelines. So uh, basically uh, coming from a country in uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, uh, which is very, uh, how do I say, governed by, uh, how do I say, religious rules, you know, Islamic country. Okay, so there are a lot of things when it comes to this kind of biasness, uh, language usage, uh, the stereotypical issues. Uh, are swept under the carpet. Okay, so what what is actually needed is uh, coming out visibly, being uh, more uh, how do I say open, uh, explicit, in terms of learning. Okay, and development. That's very very important. Okay, so uh, it starts with education from the beginning because this this is an issue which is uh, that's uh, that exists but it's not being addressed in the context of Malaysia, for example. Okay, so uh, it has to start with education and it has to start with the educators themselves. If the educators do not believe in, uh, how do I say, uh, having uh, equality and then at, at the same time promoting diversity, uh, it will be a failure. So educators themselves must be trained on how uh, they're gonna learn and how they're gonna make the, their students learn and, and develop on this. Okay, so next one is uh, there are no clear rules and regulation or policies set by the government on these matters. Okay, so uh, it should be led from the top. That's very, very important. It should be top down. So when there are visible, clear rules and acts on how uh, language is used to represent a particular group, so there are some rules that people can fall back on. Okay, for example, uh, if you go to advertising companies nowadays, uh, if there's no auditing done uh, and uh, there's no clear rules uh, pro, uh, what in, informed to them, okay, nobody will care. Okay, so that, that's very, very important in terms of uh, leading from the top, having some rules, uh, some policies in place. And next one, at the workplace itself, workplace, for example, uh, advertisement industry, for example, uh, and all the other industries which are product related to us, uh, particular groups, you know, they should have, uh, how do I say, uh, uh, training at workplace for their employees, for their staff, to uh, talk about this openly, to discuss about this matter, to have uh, people of all groups to sit down together and deliberate on the matter openly. There should be no, uh, how do I say, criticism against one particular group. Okay, one particular group is neglected or marginalized. Okay, it shouldn't be dominated, for example, uh, by the male only. Okay, so these are the things that are very, very, very important. The training and the awareness at workplace. If learning and development did not work at the school, so right. this is where it happened. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. Manjit, uh, for your perspective. And hopping over to some of our on-site panelists, maybe we can get Arnaldo. Uh, what do you think of the question on um, what was mentioned earlier about, you know, the potential negative case against the use of AI currently to address this issue? Um, all right. I, I, I really think that it is uh, something that needs to be... Um, that we need to go under to go to research more about it because um, I see that AI has a perspective of improving and bringing something different and something new, but also um, reflects on the people that develops it. So if we have some structures that uh, are structures of power and uh, we reproduce it to impose what is correct or what's not correct it might be it might not be something that is quite uh, applicable i was thinking about also on the perspective that the the question that will sent us of all the marginalized um, talking and languages such as pajuba and 
uh, it remembered me about the Preto Gage. That is a variation of Portuguese that came with the people that were colonized. And also about the indigenous people talking in languages that were like borrowed from the, the world, and especially in Brazil, that we don't know how to talk, how to teach, and how to keep it going. So I feel that we have to develop something, especially in the internet, that provides our existences to be more participative and that we do not erase our memories and our lives just because there is something and the colonialism is there to put in perspective what might be and who has the power and this is always the cisgendered white male from Europe. Right, thank you so much Arnaldo. So, um, well, that's enough for the question. We're moving on to our next question, which would be, how can these online linguistic gender stereotypes result in negative experiences for youth, both online and in the real world? So, so I'd like to start with our on-site speaker, Julia, if you would uh, be able to share on this, yeah, on the question. It is hard to pinpoint uh, or to so sort out where to start because uh, so many possibilities uh, and they are not, uh, they're n never positive probably. I, uh, for, for my line of study, we uh, go, we have like minimum the uh, damage outcomes and also we have uh, outcomes that are that, that, that end lives that end uh, that end groups too because uh, this mobilization of online uh, online linguistic uh, gender stereotypes on the internet has can uh, drive away many women and many gender diverse people, trans people, specifically from, from spaces. That is probably the most uh, recurring eff uh, negative effect. And the ones who power through, the ones who uh, do decide to, to move on and uh, face uh, the discrimination and be there and do, uh, do not think, do not... Uh, decide that they don't want to be there because uh, there, meaning uh, any social media or uh, platform group, study group, or, uh, a, or a game community. If they decided to, if they don't decide to move on, they decide to stay with that community, they can, uh, they will over and over experience uh, a gradative hate and a gradative, uh, more violent experiences, which can result into uh, distortion of self-image, of self-worth. It can result to, uh, the, to the many mental diseases. And also, we can, it, it will always uh, and it will always end up uh, building in their minds that that is not a space for them. And that or they should be under a specific uh, expectation of what is gender and what, how they should behave and how they should talk. Right. Thank you so much, Julia. So you mentioned the perception of self-worth, and I think it's really good to ask. So how... To, for our speakers, how can such online linguistic gender stereotypes affect users' perceptions of their self-worth and value? And the secondary follow-up question would be, what implications would this have on our current digital uh, gender digital divide? So I'd like to start this round of question and answer off with, with uh, your opinion from Umut. Okay. Uh, well, exactly my, my research is about exactly the effects that the 
that this kind of use or gender gender stereotype language has on the self identity of the people. Most of the people say to me that they actually never get to fully uh, feel identified with the with the platform that they were using because most of the time they had to mold themselves to something that they aren't. So they came up with kind of problems or anxiety, just how to present themselves online in a way that actually they don't uh, go against uh, uh, the community standards. Also came with some issues or, or, or sometimes get some people actually stop using the platform because they never feel well there but, and and they felt left behind of the conversation and they became like a issue in the way they socialize with the rest of their partners or the rest of the community because they actually they can fully express themselves on the plan. So we see in that actually the platforms that's and in the community standard or the way they moderate the content are seen to be like no harmful, but actually they are when it comes to gender diversity because people are not adapted to the normatives or the roles expected by the gender binary are affected in a way that they, ne they can fully spread themselves in the platform. So that came up with consequences to their mental health. Right, thank you so much, Uma. It's very, uh, I mean, I think it's very um, enlightening that you mentioned that they never feel fully identified. And I guess the sense of belonging, which was also mentioned earlier by our panel, is really important to consider. So for the same question, um, I'd like to go over to perhaps uh, Juliana, or what your thoughts are on, you know, how can such online linguistic gender stereotypes affect self-worth and value? Um, okay. Maybe because um, I will talk about the 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 slur and the negative words has be addresses to women and girls, and then it will be affect. As I mentioned, it will be affect how they decide to act, uh, uh, active in internet. So. Yes, uh, as Umut said, this is important to address this kind of online bullying with the certain negative words. Uh, because I know you understand this, the language has different ones in different culture, but uh, because uh, if the, the some, some language has the certain negative, negative impact or negative meaning in some culture, maybe we can think is we can promote more more inclusive or more gender neutral in language and so it can you know it's, it can be with uh, people has more, more safe to express themselves in the internet and the second one is but the profile the content in internet with the women and the girls perspective and and profile before the chat gpt era uh, Wikipedia has the work uh, has some several, several organized several Wikigap. Wikigap is the uh, tra translate and uh, create the the content about the women. Uh, so the internet will be more more content and more profile about the women and by the women. So I think this is my opinion. Right. Thank you very much, Julian. It's, I mean, like you mentioned, real life uh, examples of you know what's generally attributed online, and I think we have um, an intervention from. Add on to that point, and what we've been seeing is that the gender digital divide has been increasing ever since two thousand nineteen. So, despite the pandemic forcing a worldwide digital transformation. Um, and the emerging technologies and rapid advancements have still resulted in women being left behind. And global statistics, uh, in my opinion, just do not do this issue justice as the gender digital divide worsens when considering further marginalized women like the elderly or women in rural areas or uh, other parts of the community. And according to UNICEF, more than 90% of jobs worldwide have a digital component. And with most of the data on the gender digital divide being on women above 18, 
uh, what we're seeing is there's not enough research done for women below or young girls below 18. And basically my point is that these li online linguistic gender stereotypes will most definitely affect their perceptions of what jobs or careers are quote unquoteable, uh, they're able to choose or supposed to be for them. Right, thank you. Right, so thank you very much from our speakers for the round two of sessions. So we're coming up to the last six minutes. I'd like to ask if there are any questions from our on-site participants and online as well. Right, go ahead, please. Hey, okay. So um, thank you. My name is Henat. I'm from the Youth uh, Brazilian Delegation. Um, first of all, thank you for the panel. Really, really, really interesting. I want to actually make some sort of a tangent comment and to discuss a bit about um, platform algorithms, especially in visual platforms, maybe something related to what um, Mr. Vasquez uh, mentioned before about TikTok, like TikTok and Instagram. Uh, we see that young girls using platforms to promote themselves, using their own bodies as commodity, and being um, vulnerable to predators. So I, I was wondering what the panel might think that we can do to protect our youth in digital platforms considering this, and how we can uh, moderate comments and the language, and how civil society can act in defense of our youth, especially young girls, in these um, visual platforms. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Maybe, um, Dana Raj, would you have any comments on that? Yes, thank you for the question. I'll make maybe three, three quick uh, suggestions or thoughts. So one is there's a lot that the platforms themselves can do. So for example, you, you mentioned TikTok, Instagram, and others. In um, having a better design of their platform to allow the youth and users of the platform to address um, to, to, to better control the kind of bad content or push back against bad content that they might receive. Um, there's also the privacy and or targeted kind of model that all these platforms use. Uh, having greater privacy protections on these platforms can reduce the degree of targeting and the, therefore the degree, degree of uh, what I call algorithmic amplification that's pro, that, that you see or that you'll observe on these platforms. Um, so, for example, if it is a case of uh, young girls um, um, either, uh, you know, being exploited or things like that, the, the, the extent to which the algorithms would promote that kind of thing can be reduced, particularly on the platform side, if there are changes to the design and changes to how um, they are, uh, they, the, the incentives that they have in place. And the last thing I'll say is that a lot of what happens on a platform is still unclear because as researchers, as governments, civil society, activists, we don't have a lot of insight. We don't have sufficient insight into what's happening on the platforms. And what's important there is that the platforms, the social media platforms, provide more data in a safe and secure way for researchers to better understand what's happening, because then we ourselves could come up with better solutions to address some of the problems that the person in the audience raised. Right, thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, Dana Raj, for your comment on that. I guess we can see that hopefully in the future we definitely do need to have more representation from private sector on this on such an issue. So I'd like to move on to a question we have from an online uh, participant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tsukiho Kishida, for your. Um, so I'll just read it out. Thank you for sharing important perspective. Um, you're a master student from social linguistic and research cyberbullying in terms of communication. Um, you're interested in the presentation. Your question is, it's difficult to judge whether some hate speech happens from gender bias because there are many factors in a context. Under this situation, should we tackle hate speech from gender stereotypes? So perhaps we'll have a youth perspective on uh, this and then we'll hop, hop over to Dana Raj as well again or anyone else from the panel who want to take this question. Uh, maybe Umut, could we get your input on it? Okay. Uh, what should we do to tackle his speech from gender stereotype? 
Firstly, take care of youth, right? Uh, we need to uh, bet on next generations. Our uh, age, uh, or sorry, our age group, like the one that uh, 20 years old uh, to to the 50, 70 year old, uh, years old, are already dealing with too many problems that stems from. Uh, Edu from education in the first and the second infancy. And there, there are many, uh, there are many ways to do that. And each school should uh, study what are the main problems in the community. Sometimes uh, girls have problems in addressing uh, their uh, physiological uh, necessities so some other communities have more problem talking about uh, sexual education other communities uh, have other problems talking about uh, uh, the, the the social place of, of of the woman and the man and other gender diverse people and but also uh, we, you as a uh, undergraduate can study also, what does, what, how to generate empathy in people who are now uh, disconnected from this, this, this scene? What can you do to uh, close, to, to get them closer to you and to, uh, to the topic and to the subject? Because uh, we have also a really uh, a perfect uh, uh, population in our age, in the undergrad, in the undergraduates, in the in the majors and the PhDs, that they don't want to progress. They don't want to uh, go any further because they think it's obvious. Like uh, everybody reserves equal rights. But how can we uh, captivate uh, the audience who isn't opposed? but not actually involved in, uh, uh, in a development of a better world. Thank you, Julia. So uh, we'll just hop off to um, one of our uh, online speakers, Dana Raj, and then we'll follow with Arnaldo's intervention. Thank you. Great, thank you. I fully agree with uh, Julia's uh, response. And I just wanted to add that, and in fact, I think Julia had mentioned this earlier, there is a group of um, younger boys, men that are influenced heavily in what research is called a manosphere, this kind of uh, bubble of hate speech and gender stereotypes that drives a lot of hate that come from, comes from then. I think a big issue here then is for young men, men, boys, particularly cisgendered men like myself, to reflect and consider the impacts of hate speech that and or uh, false information that we might share online. And as, as they said earlier, there has to be a degree of empathy, but I think starting with young men and boys is important. So I, I'd like to add also that mm, although we don't have any legislation that works internationally to talk about these patterns and how to directly um, put something as hate speech and that gender stereotype, I feel that one can be used to identify uh, another. And probably the in the future, the way to, to tackle it must be breaking the stereotypes. But nowadays I feel that it's not necessarily um, viable. <laughs> um, we have so much um, routine stereotypes that we need daily to break and, and innovate that I feel that we need uh, more time to, to talk about it, to innovate it, and I feel that one can be used to identify and try to be better in the future. 
Thank you so much, Arnaldo. So just quickly reading out Umut's response in the chat, probably changing the narrative of gender stereotype that is under attack to generate a response that's, that does not leave doubt with what is actually said, uh, that what is actually said is hate and not freedom of expression and that it affects the human rights of women or gender diverse people. So really quickly, Juliana, if you could keep your uh, comments under one minute. Okay, I'll be short comment because uh, and others are already mentioned by Julia and Dennis and Umut. I think, uh, yeah, it's it's be quite challenges to, to how to to beat the head speeds in online space because when some some uh, uh, some women and girls will attack in online space, some people will be say that it's just your feelings. So you. Just don't take it for granted, or just don't take in your mind. But I think it will be empathy or some, not regulation as the law at the country, but more uh, community regulation. How how it could be shared or how how it could be uh, talk in this community how, and. Mm -hmm. Take, uh, take some action from, from the field, from the community member right. in online, Thank you, for Julia. example, if some, yeah. Yeah, something like So sorry like to that. cut you here because we're over time by five yeah. minutes. Thank you everyone for joining in our panel. If I could just get everyone to um, maybe come in for a picture, if you could have your uh, video on, Dana Raj, Umut, Dr. Manjit, and Juliana. Yeah, Juliana is fine. And if anyone else wants to join from the audience, it's also okay. And yeah, we'll just get a quick picture with everyone. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So, um, yep. Thank you so much for the pres your, your sharing and everything. I think it's really great that we had an opportunity to discuss this. We see a lot of future for this topic, and maybe we'll see everyone at a regional IGF or at the next IGF next year. So thanks again, and if you are interested to you know, network with any of the speakers after, please do feel free to contact the session organizers. And to look out for more from netmission.asia, we'll definitely be continuing the discussion on this topic, leading for a youth perspective from the youth ourselves. So thank you once again to our speakers joining us from all across the world, and for all our participants and, speak and our panelists here.